to the latest edition of GBB Live. And hey, we are talking about a visual version of GBB Live. For all those who have you know listened over the years, I do apologize that you have to see my face again. Thankfully, I've got another former host of GBB Live, a good friend of mine, good friend of you know the show. This is kind of a, a dual production between uh, BCM, uh, Bluff City Media, GBB Live, and Parker Fleming's wonderful content that he does over at Substack Elitist. But the one and only Parker Fleming has been kind enough to join me. Parker, how are you doing this afternoon, sir? Man, I'm good. You know, uh, we're four days away as of recording this from the NBA draft lottery. And, you know, while all these possibilities are great, you know, we don't know until the pick. Like over on Substack Elitist, I wrote, a prospect profile on Alex Saar in the event the Grizzlies get the number one draft pick, but all that may not matter. So that's why I was like, you know what? I got to get this out now in case it doesn't happen. And so obviously you prep for different scenarios and stuff. So I'm finally glad that we will at least know the pick. And then from there, explore different scenarios, which I'm sure we'll talk about on this show. But Sean, I'm glad to be talking Grizzlies basketball with you, man. Absolutely. Now, I will say this, you know, at the start of the year, around this time, I know that many, including myself and Parker, we kind of had been hoping that we would talk about the Grizzlies, you know, coming up playoff game, but that just was not in the cards. So, but hey, if what you had planned is not in the cards, it's good to have, you know, another opportunity that can help out the future. And that's exactly what we're looking at. You know, myself and Parker, we've talked about, you know, how while this last, last year, gap year, whatever you want to call it, yeah, it didn't work out in terms of wins and losses, but you had the emergence of Gigi Jackson. You had the emergence of Vince Williams Jr. You now basically have both of them on first round rookie contracts for the foreseeable future. So that gives the Grizzlies some some wiggle room to kind of, you know, see what they could do in this draft. And, uh, you know, we'll get into some of the specifics here in a minute. But of course, you know, for those who, you know, have, have been following along with the Grizzlies, let's kind of get into what the Grizzlies are looking at. What do we mean by seventh best odds? Okay, the draft is going on on Sunday, Mother's Day at, I believe, two o'clock Central. Normal representative Elliot Perry will, will not be in attendance. Uh, he, I know that he lost his mom. It's Mother's Day. Best to you know Elliot and anybody else who you know this Mother's Day will not be with their mom. But uh, so I believe Tayshawn Prince will be there for the Grizzlies um, uh, this time around. But when we talk about seventh best odds, what that means is is that it doesn't mean that the Grizzlies have the seventh best chance of just getting the number one pick. It means that the Grizzlies have the seventh best chance to get as high a pick as possible. So Parker, check me on this, but I'm, I'm going to try to go into this explanation. So if we were to go on a 100% scale, right, the Grizzlies had the chance within the first 11 picks to land any of those top 11 picks instead of number five and number six, okay? On a 100% scale, they have a certain percentage of landing one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine, ten, or eleven. Now, to make it simple, it's less than a two percent chance to get picked ten or eleven. So, hopefully, we won't worry about that. But right. there is a sixty-seven total percent chance of getting picked seven, eight, nine. They have a twenty percent chance of getting picked seven, a thirty-four percent chance of getting picked eight, and a thirteen percent chance of getting. Pick nine. So basically, two thirds of our chances are landing picks seven, eight, and nine. But then the other 31, 32% allow for us to land somewhere in the top four. We have a between a seven and a half and eight and a half percent chance to land one of one, two, three, or four. So, in other words, if you're watching, if you're wanting to make the lottery as exciting and dramatic as possible, a friend of the show, DeMichael Cole, pointed this out to me. If you're wanting to make this as exciting as possible, if the Grizzlies, if you've not seen the Grizzlies logo by pick eight, at that point, there's a better chance that we're landing in the top four than there is we're landing pick seven. So fingers crossed, we don't see that Grizzlies logo by pick eight. But Parker, does that kind of sum it up a little bit? May have been too thorough, but I, I, yeah. I, think I nailed it a little so bit. You, you knocked it out. In, in, in pure stats, SAC fashion, you knocked it out of the park there. I will say, to make it easy, so they'll do the draft lottery for the top four picks and then picks five through 14 will be by team record of the remaining teams that did not land in the top four. So that is why the Grizzlies cannot get the fifth or sixth pick in this year's draft because they had the seven best odds. I appreciate that. Explanation. Record. Appreciate that explanation. So in this episode, now that we kind of break it, broke down kind of where the Grizzlies look at as far as what they can land, 
Parker, let's go pick by pick because this is a draft. People have called it a weak draft. I'm going to go with it being a weak draft as well. I think Sam Bassini, um, his game theory pod is, is phenomenal. He, him um, and uh, um, uh, the the uh, Bryce Simon, Bryce Simon um, from from Motor City, um, Motor City, Motor Michigan. City Hoops. Yeah, and he yeah. also. Go has ahead. a Pistons podcast with Amari Santofa. Yes, a former uh, former athletic uh, writer for the Grizzlies. Uh, both Bryce and Sam, excellent draft minds. But br- Sam brought up something uh, in a couple of mock drafts ago. Go check out the Game Theory mock drafts. It's great coverage. But he said something that really stood out to me about this draft. And Parker, it kind of backed up what you said. He mentioned that the opinion around the league is basically this is a draft where with the, wherever you're picking in the lottery, you likely have a – more valuable part of your core already on your team in this than what's in this draft. In this draft, you're trying to pick the right person to support the one or two players that are already your core. And for the Grizzlies having an established core, that puts them in an even better position, whereas other teams are still going to try to be fighting, maybe getting, you know, they're going to try to find a diamond in the rough to be a part of their core. So long story short being that, you know, when we talk about this being a weak draft, it's mainly there's a good chance you're going to find good role players in this draft, but the star level players, it's hard to find another draft that, you know, has not had a star level player maybe since 2013. But Parker, your thoughts on that, you know, initial observation, especially of this, you know, group of players in the lottery. Yeah. I mean, I said on, on X a few days ago, the last time a draft class was called week was 2020 and it's yielded Anthony Edwards, LaMelo Ball, Desmond Bain, Tyrese Halliburton, Tyrese Maxey, uh, Devin Fassell, Danny Advia. And that's not including a lot of the really good role players that are contributing on winning teams as well. Like, th- like I think with this class, I think it's better than people are giving credit for. I will say it's weak in the fact that there's not a surefire cornerstone. There's not a Victor Wimbenyama. There's not a one-two like Zion Williamson and John Morant. There's not an Anthony Edwards. It's not one of those drafts. And that's okay, especially if you're the Memphis Grizzlies. You already got your core. You need guys that can amplify your core. And a lot of the guys that we'll be discussing to do so are are guys that the Grizzlies could realistically get. And also, too, like, just like every, like, and it's also really just like every draft, you'll have guys at the top of the board that aren't going to pan out, just like every draft. You will have guys further down that, will that will pan out and be awesome like we give all this crap about 2013 and rudy gobert Giannis on a emerged as all of famers and i mean rudy gobert he's an all-time defender Giannis on all-time player and they were in a weak class so there is talent to be had and it's up for these gms to identify and develop that talent Absolutely. And, and you know, a couple other things about this, you know, it's about the system that you get in. It's about the skill sets being featured and things like that. You know, I know I don't think that there is a, in any way, shape or form a, a bad thing about going with the best player available type opportunity. In this draft, it probably is a bit harder to identify that best player available. And for some Best player available may be a player archetype that is going to, if they hit, is going to potentially give you the most value, like in playoff scenarios and things like that. And I completely get that. Your two-way wings, your two-way combo guards, they come alive as being, you know, targets in that essence. But I also think that in a draft where, you know, hey, five to eight people may make sense as the best player available, depending on what team is on the clock in picks three through ten, In this point, need. In this point, specific skill sets that you want to get on your roster. Those may have a bit more value. Getting certainty with this pick may have a bit more value than it would in other drafts. So I think that's another thing that may factor a bit more into teams' draft decisions this year than compared to other years. Yeah, and to, you know, we can't consider, and this isn't to discredit anyone's work at at all, at all, because people at, you know, ESPN, they do a lot more homework than you and me, Sean. They have the access that we do not have. But, you know, best player available isn't what's reading as best available on the ESPN ticker on draft night. Because I, I, I like one thing that Sam Ficini does when he builds his boards. He'll say, this board may not reflect what this team's board is or what this team's board is. And that could be dependent on what the team needs or what the team 
potentially their philosophy is. Like, for example, oh, like I'll give a non grizzly example. For example, OKC, when they're picking at 12, they may not want to go get an Isaiah Collier because they have all these ball handlers. They may value a Kyle Filipowski more, even if Isaiah Collier is like a consensus 11 or 12 and Filipowski is more of like a 17, 18. They might say, hey, we value Filipowski more because of what he can provide on this team versus versus what this guy can. So that's one trap to not fall into on draft night, not, on, not only with just the variance in this class, but also, too, these boards are going to look so much more different on a team-by-team basis. Well, one thing that stands out about this draft, and, and it may be because in terms of those combo guards, uh, combo forwards, things like that, and especially in terms of offensive upside, th- this draft you know, probably is lacking on that depth a bit more than other drafts. This is definitely a draft that is defined, that its depth is defined by bigs. No matter where you are in the first round, the lottery, the teams, late first round, early second round, there are, I would say, Parker, 8 to 10 bigs who could legitimately have first round grades, not saying they're going to be picked in the first round, but that you could see a team going after. And so wherever you are picking in this draft, you're going to have the opportunity to land a big. Not all of them may turn out to be, you know, decade long starters in the NBA, but they could be rotation players, you know, in the right system. And what is important about that to me, at least from a Grizzlies perspective, that's a need that we have. You know, defensive oriented bigs is definitely something that we could use. And I think that's kind of going to reveal itself as me and you kind of go down this draft board. So let's, let's, let's end all the suspense. Let's yeah. start the, the ping pong balls have dropped. We are excited as heck. Adam Silver and, and all the others, I forget the guy's name that usually does the ping pong balls. But the point that I'm getting at is, is that Parker Fleming, the Memphis Grizzlies have landed the number one pick in the 2024 draft. What's the process at that top pick? So, so the process at the top pick. So I'm I'm going to pretend like there's I have a idea of the other teams at the bottom. I saw Bleacher Report. You know they had an article of like one trade each lottery team should do. I don't know if it was with their draft pick or not, but whoever was writer on Bleacher Report, I think it was Zach Buckley, suggested the Grizzlies should trade the number one pick for Jalen Duran and the Detroit pick wherever that may fall. Which that can solve a center need. I don't. I mentioned that possibility in this article that's coming out on Substack Elitist tomorrow, the lottery scenarios. I don't know what the likelihood of the Pistons trading Jalen Duran is, but if it comes to, you know, an idea of like, hey, we're going to go out in free agency and we're going to go get Nick Claxton or Isaiah Hartenstein, we're going to pay them above market grade for, for us to swipe them from their teams, then that might op- open the door for that kind of deal, especially too, where, you know, they could talk about, pairing Kay Cunningham with Alex Sar and then Hart and Shiner Claxton. Like that would be a that would be a good move for them. But also too, I, I don't know. I, I just don't know if Detroit how much they value Jalen Duran in that sense. Like will they want to trade off of Jalen Duran and their lottery pick to move up to number one? We'll see. The other one, I know Sean Leaf talked about this one, but the salary of Santi Aldama Zaire Williams and John Conchar equals exactly Denny Advia of the Washington Wizards. And, you know, everyone's been trying to search for that, like Aaron Gordon, like the, hey, who's that miscast player who's a good player, but he's on a lottery team and he's tasked to do a little bit too much, might be a little miscasted in his role. Grant Williams. Yeah, is the first one. He has positional size and skill to play the three or the four. Excellent defender. Good rebounder. He improved as a shooter. I think if the Grizzlies were to get number one, I think the first call to make for trade from a trade standpoint would be that trade down with Denny Advia. Especially too, like, could you imagine, Sean, if you did that and you could walk away on draft night with Denny Advia and Donovan Klingon? I'd be ecstatic. I'd because be ecstatic. then you also don't have pressure to start Klingon on day one. Exactly. You can exactly. start, you could do Job ja, Bain, Advia, Clark, Jaron. You could do Job ja, Bain, whoever you want at the three, whether you want Vince, Gigi, or Smart, Denny, and Jaron. Or you are you can just be huge and do Job ja, Bain, Denny, Jaron, Klingon. Like, no. so, but overall, uh, 
the, the Grizzlies have never had the first pick, ever. I would just take Alex Sar because I think he is far and away the best prospect in this class. Yeah. No, I agree. And, and I think that this is going to be the theme as we go down through these picks. Like I mentioned, there are going to be bigs at each part of the draft. You know, you got Saar picks one or two, Klingon picks three through eight. You know, you get into um, the, uh, the the weight lottery, you got the Filipowskis or, you know, um, the, 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 the E. Misi. Um, you know, you, you've got others in the teens like a, um, um, a Deron Holmes, Khalil Ware, you know, those level of players. So the point that we're getting at is, is that at number one, the pick is easy. You pick Alex Sar. But if you can get, if you can get a young role player currently in the NBA by trading back with the Washington or Detroit, and you still keep your pick, you still could pick a pretty intriguing rookie on that four-year plan or on that four-year deal, along with the established NBA player you get, that's more valuable than Sar. That's the point that we're getting at. So if you yeah. could, yeah, if so if you were to trade back and you were to get a Duran. And then you trade back and you get a castle. Durin and Castle are more valuable than Sar. If you were to get an Avia, and by trading back you get a Klingon, Klingon and Avia are more valuable than Sar. So it's pretty simple. If you can make a trade that makes sense, do it. But if not, just pick Alex Sar. And, and Parker, I think that's kind of where we stand as far as picks one and two. Basically, picks one yeah. and two, go with Sar if you can't trade back. Yeah, and I will say just, I wrote on Sar on sub and... The thing that intrigues me the most with Star is the way that Jaron and BC succeeded with their interchangeability on both sides of the ball, mainly, but mainly defensively. You would get that same thing with Sar, but except Sar's seven one and not six eight like Clark. So I think with Sar, Jackson, Smart, and Vince Williams, you would really create an infrastructure to have. Perhaps the top de- or a top defense. I, I don't want to say the top defense because I mean we just saw what Minnesota just did to Denver in that game too, and gosh, it was a thrashing. But I think Sar could enter a situation with Memphis where it's different than most number one picks because he wouldn't have the pressure to be this fifteen point per game score. He won't have this pressure to change the franchise. All he has to do is just fit in, fit in. Finish plays as a screen and roller, as a cutter, somebody who roams the dunker spot, provide a lot of defensive value as a switcher, as somebody who can even hold perimeter players. Like one thing the Grizzlies did with Jackson and Adams, and I'm sure we'll talk about this with cutting in, is at Jaron would defend on the perimeter with Adams being the primary rim protector, typically the one in ball screens and drop coverage, and then Jackson's rim roaming. You can interchange that with Saar and Jackson, but Jackson could take more of that responsibility while Saar is still kind of learning the intricacies of an NBA defense. But Saar has the legitimate quickness to be a terror when it comes to defending the perimeter. So just that two-way upside with the the duo of Jaron Jackson Jr. and Alex Saar, it's too tantalizing for me to pass up. And the comp that we consistently see for Alex Saar is Jaron Jackson Jr., so yeah. if you're getting comp to somebody, what better way to be that somebody than learning from that somebody? So, you know, it's a it's a great thing. And and, and I'm not saying that Saar and, and Derek Lively are two different prospects. Lively's probably more, you know, Klingon S, even Klingon and, and Lively are different. But the point that I'm getting at is, is that you see kind of how Dallas is is, you know, implementing Lively. They went out, they got other bigs, a multi-year contract, so they can have that rotation. The point is, is getting a SAR or getting a Klingon. It's not to sit here and say that either one of these players are going to be playing with Jaron 35 minutes a night. It's the ability to create a reliable front court rotation that can allow the Grizzlies to give different looks in the front court based off the matchups, especially in the playoffs, that they're playing. And so, depending on what the game situation calls for, you've got the ability to put in different lineups that can find success in different ways to have multiple chances to win. So, that's kind of where we are, picks one and two. Sars on the board. Go ahead. So, let's dive into this quick possibility real quick. Okay. You get the second pick. Okay. Sars off the board. All right. You can't get the trade down. Who are you picking? Clinging. Yeah, all right. We're on the same page. I would pick Klingon. I would, with the trade down, I would definitely be trying to see if there's anyone who wants Richie Shea. Be like, hey, trade up a couple spots, 
can go get him, but go give give us a rotation player in your pick. Yeah. And and like I say, at that second pick, I, I'm not saying that Klingon, me suggesting that we take Klingon at the second, third, or fourth pick if a trade doesn't work out. That's not me suggesting. I don't think Klingon would be, he may not even be on the top five in my final board in terms of upside. You know, Ron Holland, Matas Buzelis, uh, Nikola Topic, uh, I'm saying these names wrong probably, Rob Dillingham. In theory, individual value-wise, those players may have higher upside. But in terms of filling the need on the on, on the Grizzlies, that would also provide significant value. I just think Klingon makes a lot of sense. And he's not a reach. Like, he's not a reach. Um, you know, once we get to that point. Now, if Memphis has made a move before this already and they brought in an established center, then it gets a bit interesting. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But yeah, after pick one, if SARS off the board, I don't think that it's there's anything wrong. Pick two, pick three, pick four, pick seven, pick eight of picking Klingon if SAR is off the board. But let's kind of talk about that scenario a bit. You know, Parker, say we do get that established center, and Grizzlies then land pick three or four. If we've got the established center, do you still go with Klingon again to truly build that front court rotation, or is there another player or two who really intrigue you to go in that top four? Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like, I mean, obviously, unless you do a trade on the week of draft week, which the Grizzlies, you know, they have traded for Steven Adams and before the 2021 draft to move up to the 10th pick. Last year, they traded out of the 20, uh, 25th pick to go get Marcus Smart. It's possible they do something before that. And then we're not even talking about Clayton on draft night because they have a starting center. So I kind of had this frame of reference right now of, for the for who out of like the Grizzlies to take and wherever they fall on the board because there's so much fluidity right now and on draft night with this class. For me, it's either Alex Saar, Donovan Klingon, Reed Shepard, Ron Holland, Nikola Topic, or Stefan Castle. Those, those are the only guys that, I mean, not the only guys, but those are the main guys, I would say, that I'd be really targeting heavily if I'm the Memphis Grizzlies for, for different reasons. I, I don't know if you want me to, I can kind of rapid fire my reasonings. Here, uh, with Klingon, I mean, it's simple. Uh, the rent protection, he gives you a lot of what you missed with Steven Adams. And even then, he's also so early in his development that you can kind of put, you know, like, hey, this is part of your developmental package. Shoot one, three, a game from either the top of the key or from the corner. That way, we're gonna you're going to get comfortable with it, make defense on it. But also, too, I think the thing that really... The, re- the thing that really stood out to me that honestly solidified Klingon as a top five guy for me is just the passing. He was a legitimate connector for that UConn offense. That UConn offense is so beautiful. It is so beautiful to watch. It made me love watching college basketball just a little bit. But just the imposing size, especially in a conference where you're going to be running through, for the time being, Nikola Jokic, uh, the, the duo of... I mean, let's say and we got to say trio now. The trio of Rudy Gobert, Carl Anthony Towns, and Miles Reed. Then you also have Chad Holmgren and Victor Like you're, you're running through a lot of size. So having a front court locked up with Jaron Jackson Jr. and Donovan Klingon helps kind of, I want to say, give you an advantage, but it at least levels the playing field quite a bit, if not tilted towards the Grizzlies in because of how good Jaron Jackson Jr. is. But uh, Shepard, he's just an elite processor. You know, he's, I mean, he shot 52% from three. I think he's, he's an electrifying outside shooter. And I'm going to, I'm excited to dive into this. I've already gotten into the tape, but I haven't gotten into like actually putting it into an article. But Reed Shepard is a fl- flamethrower off the dribble, absolute flamethrower. Sean, you're a stats guy. You would love this. Reed Shepard had an effective field goal percentage off the dribble. So for those who don't know, effective field goal percentage is essentially your field goal percentage with like a weighted average between the value of three-point shot and value of two-point shot. His effective field goal percentage off the dribble was 65%. The only player in the NBA right now who had about a similar mark this season was Mike Conley. So like, 
He just has more live dribble juice to give it credit for. He can jump into passing lanes. I do think he has defensive questions because of his size, but he has impeccable timing when it comes to jumping in passing lanes. Closeouts, too. He'll block threes. Even though at his size, even though he's built like a Sigma Chi, he'll close out and block threes. It's absurd. Um, Nikola Topic, Ron Holland, I know they can't, they're not major shooting prospects right now, but they have a trademark skill with their advantage creation and getting two feet into the paint at their size. Can't have enough of that. I would I would be pretty thrilled if Holland or Topic were Grizzlies. And as Stefan Castle, he's just that quintessential winner, a winner. He is a winning role player. Literally the only hole in his game right now is outside shooting. I think he needs to show willingness. He needs to do with accuracy. But I think his indicators with the runner and his free throw percentage indicates he can. But also, too, we've seen, we're seeing right now guys in the playoffs with his similar profile succeeding. Derek White, Dante DiVincenzo, Josh Hart. Not, not, a, not a, an exciting name to throw out there when we're coming to top five picks, but Nikhil Alexander-Walker. Guys of that prototype are making an enormous impact in the playoffs. And I can see Stefan Castle doing the exact same thing. Absolutely. So again, those names that Parker mentioned, Alex Saar, Donovan Cleegan, Reed Shepard, uh, Nikola Topic, Ron Holland, um, and who is Stefan Castle. Oh. It, it, and, and I think that those names may make a ton of sense because even if the Grizzlies have depth at these spots already and young depth at these spots already, these are still players who you could see coming into playoff minutes. Like, maybe not a lot, but they could come into playoff minutes. So, you know, but back to, you know, dis the discussion about, uh, and, and by the way, Parker, Dalton Connect. You, 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 you okay. bit to leave him off? Uh, we'll talk about him at eight or nine. Got it. So the point is, is that through picks one through four, get one, take Sar. If a trade down doesn't make sense. Picks two, pick three, even four. One thing to watch out for is I still think that a trade scenario could work out even if it's not at one, because if a Shepard and a Dillingham and a Nikola Topic are still on that board, teams that are looking for those guard-oriented players that don't have them as a part of their core right now, maybe the Spurs, um, a guard to go along with LaMelo Ball for the Hornets, um, you know, the Wizards, you know, they're going to lose Tyus Jones, um, uh, the Raptors as well. You know, if the Grizzlies can be on the board, at three or four, and you've got several guard prospects up there, maybe it makes sense for them to trade back, you know, to a six or something. You may not get that NBA established player that you were open to get, but hey, if you can get maybe an asset or two for the future and still get clinging, it can make sense. So that's another trade scenario that works out. But I think that it does make sense that in picks one through four, if Sar is on the board, take him. Then if a trade back doesn't work out, two, three, four, I don't think that you're reaching if you were to take a Donovan Klingon. But if the Grizzlies may have already made another move to bring in the center, then at that point, a Castle, a Topic, a Shepard, um, or a um, Holland may make sense. So that's all dream scenarios, Parker. Yeah. That's all, hey, this has worked out. This is a John Morant situation in 2019. A much better situation worked out than we anticipated. Let's get to what is the most likely scenario. The Grizzlies land in picks seven or eight. Now, if they land pick seven, I'm thinking at this point, trade back may happen. If you could trade back into the teens and get a really good established NBA player for someone who wants to come up and get a guard maybe or get a clinging or something, do it. You could still go back and get your big in the teens. But when it comes to pick seven, I think that it becomes just as simple as pick one, take clinging, unless you're just overwhelmed with the trade offer. Yeah, I mean, honestly, there if we're getting if we're at pick seven, pick eight, pick nine, and Klingon's on the board, I feel like it's almost a rush to the podium kind of scenario. I It's one of those things you're looking at, you know, you look at trade down possibilities, and I'll get into some in a bit, but like, I mean, you go down the board, and you're like, where is there an exact fit where you're like, the Grizzlies would could trade with this team and get better and this team would have an incentive to give up that piece and move up. I mean, I mean, Utah is the only one that strikes me, to be honest. Because even then, like, let's say, I know Chris Harrington, Daily Memphian, 
at the trade deadline, he floated just the idea of like, hey, would Orlando revisit Wendell Carter talks and do like Zaire Santi and their pick for Wendell Carter in 18? Well, it's two ends of the coin. One, Orlando's trying to win. Do they want to trade their starting center? But also two, do they want to open up a pathway for Mo Bonner, John Isaac, or Gogo Badazzi to start? But also two, do the Grizzlies want to trade down 10, 11, 12 spots? I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, so those are the only teams that I'm like, actually, there is one more team. If Castle's on the board and Klingon is not, I a lot of my Utah Jazz followers that I interacted with through the 2021 playoff series uh, between the Grizzlies and the Jazz, they love Stephon Castle. And there is a big, there's a big man on the Jazz who was second in Rookie of the Year voting in 2022, who inex, I wouldn't say inexplicably, but for some reason he came off the bench this past year, Walker Kessler. <laughs> Would you trade, let's just say Zaire Williams or Santi Aldama, how, how, we'll just say a prospect. Would you trade a prospect currently on the team and trade back a spot or two and get Kessler in their pick. Yeah. 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 And, and then at that point, <clears throat> take a castle. Maybe you get your shooter who will get connect. Yeah, yeah, possibly. Or, you know, a Reed Shepherd, if he's still there, probably won't be. But, but yes, to your point. And then if you do that, you filled in a long term option, maybe as a, as a traditional center. You've got your shooting option on a rookie contract. That frees up the potential of doing, you get creative to see what you can do with Luke Kennard's salary. So, yeah, I definitely think that makes sense. Yeah. And I, I will say, when it comes to like the whole like Luke Kennard, like if they can keep, if they could financially keep him, my preference is to keep Luke Kennard. Um, I'm, I don't want to come on your show and cause beef or anything, but I don't think Connect is an upgrade from Kennard. The but only reason he, he's not a better player because he's not going to have uh, Connect is going to be more of a, talented movement type guy, but he's definitely not going to have the percentages of Kennard. The one thing, though, that I will say that stands out to me about Connect is having him potentially on that type of player at four years, and like if you get him at pick nine or ten, what, four years, 20 million total um, on his contract, that may make a bit more sense to the Grizzlies financially than if you're not going to be able to get a Kennard at three years and, you know, 11 to 12 million. Because I'm still interested to see how Kennard is going to use Grayson Allen's four-year 70 million extension in in his contract talks. I don't think that he's going to be asking for that much, but if the Grizzlies can't land him, you know, in the three year, 33 year, 35 range, then does it become, you know, does it become worth it? I guess to talk an extension. So to me, yeah. I'm not saying you're going to find a clear Luke Kennard replacement, but if you get a shepherd or a connect on the contract that they'll come on, then that from that perspective, they could be viable replacements. Yeah. I do think the Grayson situation is a little bit different. Grayson got paid. He deserved to get paid. There's also the leverage that he and his, his team had of, hey, if you don't pay me, you're going to lose me for nothing. Because you, if, I, if, he went in free, if he went in free agency, they weren't going to afford to keep him. And they would have lost him for nothing. And this was already an asset to deplete a team. They needed to keep Grayson Allen. He, he got paid. He deserved to get paid. But that's also, I think that's also the difference. And also, too, we don't know, like, you know, Kennard missed a lot of the year with the knee injury. I don't, like, I mean, after the 2024 calendar year flip, I don't really, you know, I, I don't really hold missed games against anyone because at that point, it's just being cautious, you know? Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm interested, but bottom line, I'm interested in seeing the dynamic that happens this summer with Luke Kennard. Absolutely. It's going to be interesting to see there. I think there's just, I think, you know, I, I, I've, you know, definitely been, been, been at the front of him and uh, Taylor Jenkins, you know, support group you know, for a while yeah. over there with you, Parker. But I'm also, there, you listen, in terms of our current team, he definitely is a need. But there also is plenty of opportunities to where it would make sense to trade him. But let, let's get back to, you know, the, 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 you know, focus of the conversation in terms of what we would do with each pick. So pick one. You take Sarf, a more valuable trade back doesn't work. Pick two, three, and four, 
pick Klingon unless another trade back presents itself. If you've already traded for a center at that time, you know, I will ask you this. I'll ask you this. Say the Grizzlies trade for a center before the draft or Klingon is not on the board when their pick comes. You mentioned Holland, Topich, Shepard, and Castle. Rank those four. Uh, I I would go Holland one. He's just a, he's number two on my board. Okay, I think he has. We'll get more. And I know we had talked about wanting to do some more prospect profiles. Yeah, on the show, I'm not going to blow through it all. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Look, right now Holland with a pretty decent separation between the rest, and then I would probably go Shepard, Topich, Castle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That that's I have cling, I've clinging it for. That's interesting. That's interesting. I'm Shepard, I I'm still working my board. I'm still working my board, but the, the stuff I can kind of sharpie in right now is SAR one Holland two. Yeah. No, I, and 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 Shepard's my favorite prospect of the draft. You know, from a stat standpoint, the Kentucky guard pedigree, all that different stuff. Uh, I'd probably rank those players. I'd probably go Holland one. I, I could see myself going uh, Castle two. Shepard three, Topic Topic four, uh, just because you know I, I think that you know Shepard, I think that his efficiency still could be there. His refinement may put him above Topic on my board, but we'll we'll check that out. And that kind of gives people an idea of okay, if Klingon's not there, what prospect could make sense? But let's now talk a bit about okay, we get in that pick seven eight nine range. Klingon's not there. We have a need for a center. You've got a couple of these players on there. You know, say. You know, I would say at this point, you may have Holland and um, you would probably definitely have Castle there, um, and you'll have one of Topic and Holland there. You mentioned some trades back that could make sense, and I have some names that I think are very low chance of being available, but to me would be worth discussing trading back into the late teens. You said you had a couple of trade scenarios that could make sense. Do you have a bit more details on those? I mean, I, I gave my Kessler one. But I vaguely talked. I, I talked about the Orlando one as well. I don't have any besides those, to be honest. Um, do you have? Do you have one? Yeah, depending. And I see you're the trade guy, so I want to hear what you have. I how about this? You give the trades, and I'll give prospects to consider in the range. So the thing that I'm getting at is, is that, and I, again, I think these are very unlikely, but you never know because the teams that are going to be involved in these picks are likely going to be some of the teams that you're going to see the most active when it comes to a summer where many are anticipating a lot of player movement. You've got New Orleans there at 17 and 21. In their perspective trade scenarios, when it comes to Brandon Ingram looking for a point guard, all that different stuff, in a certain situation, could Herb Jones and, or Trey Murphy be made available in their trade scenarios? I don't think they will be, but if they are, could the Grizzlies potentially look to do that, move back and then get one of those two as their big 3-4? I, I think that could be a possibility. Say Donovan Mitchell wants to go to Miami, and then the Cavaliers take back um, you know, whatever prospects they get in that Donovan, in that Donovan Mitchell trade. They pick at pick 20. At that point, would you be willing to possibly move back if Jared Allen could be put on the board? That's another option that I would consider as well. The point that I'm getting at is... Uh, that's something with Jared Allen. Huh? That's something with Jared Allen. Yeah, go ahead. No, yeah. I'm Grizzlies, just throwing out ideas here. If the Grizzlies are 7, 8, 9, Jared Allen is somebody not only... I wouldn't even just trade down. I would trade out for Jared Allen. See, that's... And I get it. I get it. But I, I, I am a... This thing in is off the board. Correct. And if you want to trade out, that's fine. I still am a stickler for this Grizzlies team. Get someone on that four-year contract that you can put in our to our development plan. I know that in recent years it hasn't worked out, but for the Laravia and Roddy and um, Zaire's that didn't work out, maybe Laravia will, you know, in time to some extent. You still had GG and Vince work out. Um, you've had yeah. Santi work out to an extent. So I agree with you. Trading out, that's perfectly fine. I still would try my best to trade back to at least get something, an intriguing prospect on that four-year plan or on that four-year yeah. plan. Yeah, for sure. And granted, they could also move up from 39. 39 is also a little bit too rich to have a two-way contract, so they can target somebody there and give them a deal similar to what they had given Xavier Tillman when he was on the team. So those are possibilities. I mean, if they trade it back into the teens. What, what, one thing I will say before you get into your prospect, yeah, yeah. I will say this, is that 
you know, I'd mentioned that there are different levels of bigs that may be worth picking based off, you know, if you were to trade back. If you do trade back to the 17 to 22 range and you've traded back because you wanted to get that established center, well, then at that point, it, it, is it kind of, you know, worth doubling down on getting a rookie center? Maybe, but I'll let you kind of look at that. So my point that I'm getting at is it kind of contradicts itself is that if the Grizzlies are in that 7, 8, 9 range where they're most likely going to pick, but they trade back into the teens, it's likely for them to go get an established center. Then at that point, do you still pick a rookie center to tr have true long-term depth? Or is there someone else that you might go after, like a big wing or someone? I would go after I would go after a guy that can come in and immediately impact winning basketball. I wouldn't take it upside swing. I would kind of go traditional, like, hey, we're like this guy's gonna be able to step in day one and contribute. I mean, if you want to go with a big man, I mean, you can go Kyle Filipowski or Eve Missy, Deron uh, De Holmes. I know, I know ESPN has him low. The Athletic has him as a first round grade. I think No Ceilings has him first round grade as well. I think he's a first round guy. I think he's a first round guy. I would, I would pick him in the top 20. Uh, if you're not looking at a center, there's only two names that really stick out to me in this instance. Let me trade into this area. It's Tristan De Silva from Colorado and Devin Carter of Providence. Devin Carter is the son of Grizzlies assistant coach Anthony Carter. But if you also too, you could say, "Hey, we're gonna, we're we got our center, we have GG and Vince. Let's just take another upside swing. They're just gonna play in South Haven all summer." Then I would probably go Johnny Turfy. I was figuring we'd hear his name, and and note, and I agree with all those. I think all those um, make sense as potential options uh, to go with. Do I necessarily think that it's all that likely? Probably not. But at the end of the day. Um, I definitely could see um, the Grizzlies wanting to go after, um, you know, a, a player who can win now. I agree. But if they get their center and, and, and you know, if they want to, you know, take it, if they want to take an upside swing at 39, you know, may, or maybe they want to get that win now player at 39, maybe they can get someone um, in the late teens. But Parker, we, we kind of covered, um, you know, the different draft picks that, that are there. You know, I, I think, again, the focus is getting that big, that long-term big to pair with Jaron, whether it's Sar, if we, if we, you know, the basketball gods are to smile down on us, but also more than likely going after Donovan Klingon. Just some other thoughts, you know, as far as what to look out for um, when it comes to the lottery. And at the end of the day, on, on Sunday, wherever we pick, it's going to have a big impact on the rest of our offseason. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it opens up opens up the door for a lot of moves, uh, a lot of moves that you can make. Obviously, the Grizzlies are looking to just maneuver and get their roster ready to go for next season to reestablish himself as a contender, all while dodging the second apron of the luxury tax, which is which would be going $17 million over the luxury tax. So I'm very, very interested to see just how they maneuver this summer, especially to the pecking order. So shouldn't run the wings. It and also too. So I, I love this exercise that Chris Harrington does every year. He he basically ranks the players by priority at the end of each season and does it in expansion expansion draft form, where the so he has his first column be the I want to say it's about ten nine ten guys that he would not protect in expansion draft, and then the others there's your top ten. Could you imagine that six months later, you'd be talking about where your pecking order for the time being is now John Morant, Jaron Jackson Jr., Desmond Bain, G.G. Jackson, or it could be G.G. Jackson, Vince Williams, Marcus Smart, however you want to rank it, Brandon Clark, Santi Aldama. Like that's their pecking order right now when it comes to, like, I guess, who they would present an expansion draft. So now that the pecking order, especially on the wings, is a lot different and may not reflect the financial commitments that you've made on this team, I'm very much interested to see. And I'm not, I'm not talking about like Luke Kennard. And in, in that, I'm more so talking about like Zaire Williams and John Conchar. Like Zaire Williams, last year of his rookie deal, he's probably not going to get extended. You have John Conchar, first year of his extension. I, I don't know if he's in the rotation anymore or not. So they are probably going to have to choose between one of the two, if not both. Like, but I'm very just interested to see 
how they pivot this summer, but it's all going to hinge around the draft pick. That is the, you're making the decision-making tree. The pick is up here. The number of possibilities is here. And then the possibilities, depending on the picks, stem down, down and out, down and out, down and out, and just everywhere. Probably looks crazy. The board probably looks crazy. I would, that would be super cool. It would be cool exercise to do, but. You need to hire Dwight Schrute to do that type of board. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, very excited to see how um, everything shakes out. And we'll get a better understanding on Sunday. And the other thing that I'll, I'll end with on my end, and then Parker will come back to you if you have any final thoughts, is that say Klingon is off the board. And, 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 you know, I'm someone who's talked about the fact that, you know, with the fact that there are so many players who could be best players available, it just makes sense to go with Klingon to me because he will have an immediate significant role that he's feeling with the, and there's certainty with him. Like, I think he's probably the most plug and play guy in the lottery. You've got a winning pedigree and he's someone that can add value in low usage situations. I understand and completely acknowledge and think it's a valid point. Questions about how valuable can he be as we get further in the playoffs? Completely get that. But say he's off the board. You going to get a castle or a, a, a Reed Shepard or a Nikola Topic or a Ron Holland, as you mentioned. The Grizzlies have had their circles of developing wings. They've done a very good job of developing guards, especially developing the shooting ability of guards. My point that I'm getting at is, is that if you want, if, if a Shepard or a Castle or someone along those lines winds up being the pick on draft night, the possibilities with them don't end once they're drafted. You could find yourself in a position a year or two from now where between Vince Williams, Gigi Jackson, and whoever you pick, if it's a combo guard or, or a combo forward in this draft, if you if the team structure at that point makes a trade likely and you develop that player, you then have a good young player who could lead a very intriguing trade package to go get another really established NBA player that could extend our championship contending window more than you may anticipate. So the investment is not just about what they could do for us immediately. It's about also getting a good player who can come in and develop and can keep possibilities going as time goes on. I'm not saying that the number one thing for the Grizzlies to do if Klingonoff is off the board is go get a guy who they will trade later on. It's to go get a guy that they can develop and fill a role for them, and they have that possibility. To your point, it's all about taking the guy that either fills immediate needs and can win now, or if that option may not be available, going to get a guy who makes as many possibilities available for as long as possible. Yeah, and, you know, I, I'm ready to uh, – I couldn't have said it better myself – ready to just kind of, you know, dive in and break down, you know, really kind of break down these guys' games and see – okay, how does this fit, not just in the NBA context, but also like in a Grizzlies context? How do they, because at the end of the day, you want to find, I think one thing that's going to be really shape my philosophy, and I'll close with this, who can you, I'm not saying as a starter or anything, but who can you imagine in a playoff series, you either, either next year, two, three, four years down the road, who can you imagine being on the floor next to John Morant, Desmond Bain, and Jaron Jackson Jr. in a playoff series. And I feel like that kind of shapes your philosophy of how you want this pick to go. Obviously, that's not to that's not to discredit or push guys like Gigi Jackson, Vince Williams, Marcus Smart, Brandon Clark down the pecking order, but it's more about the optionality of stuff. You ultimately want this guy here to be an option for you either next year but mainly beyond to fit next to that core in order to win a championship. And you would, you would love for that to be Gigi. You would love for that to be Vince. But the whole point is, is that along with this first round pick, if it's them, that's best case scenario. That is absolutely phenomenal. But if it's not, then potentially they could be utilized as options to help you go get that guy, or they could feel the needed depth that we're seeing year after year. You've got to need when you when you don't have a clear top five player in the NBA, you've got to be able to have a roster that's versatile enough that can help you win in multiple ways, and you do that through quality depth, which has kind of been the calling card of the most successful times of the Taylor Jenkins era. Parker, before I sign us off for this edition of the podcast, anything else for you, from you? No, just um, again, glad to be doing this for Sean. Follow his work. Um, the Bluff City Media landscape has bolstered its its uh, show schedule since since I left last year with you know the additions to the Anthony Sainz show. You have the Night Court with Brevin Knight and Rob Fisher. 
probably the biggest free agent signing you'll see yep. of uh, of any sport this year. This year, um, they have great shows on the Grizzlies, great shows on the Tigers, and you know, uh, and you could also follow my work at Substack Elitis. It's all free if you choose to support. All your proceeds go to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. So yeah, glad to do this, Sean. Can't wait to do it again. Yeah, and as Parker alluded to, um, we're, we're kind of putting together a plan where, you know, we're kind of going to do these, um, you know, maybe on a week type basis, but at least during draft season, you know, we may put together, you know, five or seven, you know, maybe less shows. Where we're really going to dive into some of these prospects. Why do they make sense? What makes them so intriguing? Uh, talk about plenty of different scenarios. So don't really have a schedule as to that as of yet. We'll kind of, you know, cut, go along as time goes. But the goal is, is, you know, hopefully for me and Parker to put together several more of these videos looking at prospects deeper and, and seeing what we can find out. Please support Parker Substack Leaders. It, it, it's I, one of the best young minds in the NBA when it comes to covering the when it comes to covering the draft aspect of things, obviously, you know, fueled by his passion for the Grizzlies, but just a great mind, just excellent dude, does it for a great cause. Please go out and support Substack Elitist. And of course, Bluff City Media, you know, this being Grizzly Bear Blues Live. You've also got, you know, Grizz901. You've got the Anthony Sane show. You got No Bluff and Core Forward Next Gen. Um, so many different shows to get out there and enjoy. So make sure you check all of them out. If it's during if it's a day of the week, if it's a day day that ends in Y. BCM is likely going to have new content that's out there. But for Parker Fleming at Paca underscore Flocka on X slash Twitter, I'm Sean Coleman at Stats SAC. Until next time, go Grizzlies. We'll talk to you again soon here on Grizzly Bear Blues Live.